My aunt went ballistic and attacked me. I posted the footage online getting her thrown in jail and now her life is in shambles. I, 31-year-old female, was born with a severe genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility type. The illness varies greatly from person to person, most can lead relatively normal lives with some pain and problems. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is essentially a group of disorders caused by defective collagen in the body. This results in a host of issues, including, joint hypermobility causes joints to be so loose and unstable that they frequently dislocate or partially dislocate. Severe joint and soft tissue pain due to constant dislocations and resulting damage to the joints, among other issues. Severe, persistent exhaustion. Skin that bruises easily and, in delicate areas, can even tear. I feel dizzy when I stand up because my blood pressure drops rapidly. About 11 years ago, my condition worsened significantly, and I had to start using a wheelchair, as walking more than 100 feet became extremely dangerous for me. The risk of falling due to a hip dislocation was high. In the last three years, I upgraded to an electric wheelchair because pushing a manual chair became too painful. For reasons I don't fully understand, my aunt, who is 54, has an extreme dislike for disabled people, especially those in wheelchairs who can still move their legs. For 11 years, whenever we were alone, she treated me worse than a dog and insisted that my disorder was completely fake and made up. She claimed I was lying about it because I wanted all the attention focused on me, believing I was jealous of anyone else receiving attention, especially her. I tried to confront her about it and talk things out, but since I was already overwhelmed by my condition, I ended up keeping her comments to myself. Since I'm not confrontational and don't see her often throughout the year, I didn't want to burden anyone with it, especially as I already had to ask for so much help from the people around me, and my parents were exhausted from all the doctor's visits during that time. For the past 11 years, I've ignored every comment she made when we were alone because I had grown accustomed to it. I didn't care what she thought at this point and knew she was just being foolish. That was until things escalated last week when I visited my aunt for our yearly family dinner. She organized the dinner this year. All was going well until she drank more than usual and became much snarkier toward me in front of the family. This caused some family members to call her out and tell her it was inappropriate and uncalled for. She silently fumed, giving me intense glares afterward. My parents noticed this and kept an eye on her. Unfortunately, at some point, I went into the kitchen on the other side of the house to take a break from my aunt's stairs and take my medication in private. My aunt followed me into the kitchen and closed the door behind her. I knew this was not good since she was clearly intoxicated, so I discreetly started, recording the incident on my phone. Since the door was closed, and we were far from the others, with many people talking loudly in the other room, no one could hear us, even if I screamed. My aunt began asking if I was enjoying being an attention hog and ruining her dinner by humiliating her. I slowly tried to maneuver my wheelchair toward the door while apologizing, telling her that was not my intention. At that point, I tried to say what she wanted to hear so I could get to safety. She started raising her voice, accusing me of being jealous of her success and faking my disorder out of laziness. She began calling me every name in the book, yelling nonsense at me. I started to think she might be having a mental breakdown and began crying, pleading with her to let me go. Realizing I needed to get out of there, I decided I couldn't do so in my chair, so I tried to get up. Unfortunately, she turned aggressive and pushed me back into the chair forcefully. She screamed that she wasn't done yet and that people like me needed to be taught a lesson. She started hitting me in the face, which dislocated my jaw. Then she tried to pull me out of the chair, dislocating my arm, but I resisted, so she failed. She then managed to push my chair over on its side, causing my foot to get stuck behind the footrest. Luckily, my dad, noticing my absence and that my aunt was also gone, became concerned and began searching for me. My father later told me I let out such a blood-curdling scream that it was audible throughout the entire dining room, prompting him and my mom to sprint toward the sound. At this point, I was starting to lose consciousness from the pain. I remember my dad bursting through the door. From what I was told, my dad tackled my aunt, his younger sister, and restrained her to ensure she stayed down. My mom screamed for someone to call 911, which my nephew did immediately. My mom then got me free from the wheelchair and tried to recall her first aid training. Meanwhile, my dad pinned my aunt to the floor while my aunt's husband stood there in complete shock, not knowing what to do. The police and ambulance arrived, and they put my aunt in handcuffs. She screamed at my dad, asking how he dared to lay hands on a woman, no less his sister. My uncle then tried to defend my aunt, claiming they didn't know what had happened and that I could have tipped over myself after trying to attack her. He insisted his wife would never do something like this and that it had to be provoked. He apparently said much worse things, but my parents won't specify what exactly. I regained consciousness, likely due to receiving some strong pain medication. It's still a blur because the medication left me disoriented. I was taken away by the ambulance while my aunt was taken to jail. At the hospital, I was found to have multiple fractured ribs, a dislocated arm, and a dislocated jaw. I also suffered a concussion from the blows, but the worst damage was to my, 
foot, which turned out to be broken. I also have cuts and scrapes everywhere because my skin is so fragile. Fortunately, the injuries weren't severe enough to require surgery, but with my disorder, it will take at least 10 weeks in a cast, followed by physical therapy, although my ankle will likely be permanently damaged. I feel guilty for ruining someone's life. I've received multiple voicemails from different numbers with her screaming about how I ruined her life and possibly their finances. My uncle is trying to save his own reputation by siding with my aunt, but that's short-lived since he wants a divorce. A few family members are making me doubt if I've done something wrong, so that's why I'm asking if I'm the bad person here. I'm adding this because it somehow got deleted, I ended up sharing the footage on a private group page for our family to see. It might have been wrong, but seeing the reactions, it was probably the right thing. After that, things got much worse for her, which is why she's even angrier. Many people don't understand that when you are severely disabled, at least in my case, people often blame you for things. Combined with past traumatic experiences, this has made it really difficult for me to stand up for myself or recognize when I am truly at fault. It is hard for me to discern when people are just trying to manipulate me into believing I am the cause of the issue. I hope this helps people understand why my mind makes me think I might be at fault for these things. I am currently considering suing since my insurance covers legal costs. My aunt severely injured me and put me in the hospital because she believed I was faking my genetic disorder for attention. I recorded the entire incident and posted it online after they accused me of lying and attacking her. Now, our entire family has cut ties with her, including her church. Her husband wants a divorce. Am I in the wrong for posting it online and ruining her life? I ignored all the red flags, got gaslit for 8 months, and found out my GF was lying and cheating with her friends. Today I messed up, or maybe I messed up 8 months ago. I began dating this girl 8 months ago. For context, I am 31, and she is 30. She seemed perfect to me. We liked the same things. She said all the right things. We had so much fun together. She put as much effort into the dates as I did. Our intimate life was amazing. When I decided to date again, I knew I was looking for the one. I am at that stage in my life where I do not want to date around or have casual relationships anymore. I was very honest about who I am and what I am looking for. I felt so comfortable with her. I opened up to her and shared things I have never told anyone else. I noticed some red flags early on. She rarely communicated via text, often saying she forgot, fell asleep, or was busy. When I asked her about it nicely, she admitted she was following dating advice from TikTok to make me want her more. She said she did it intentionally but promised to change. This issue persisted throughout most of our relationship. I should have walked away then, but I did not. She had many friends, mostly guys around her age, and her other friends were a mix of immature 20-somethings from work. She said this was due to her hobbies, as she believed girls did not like video games or cars. I was okay with this, as long as she did not have any romantic history with any of them. I set a firm boundary on this. She admitted to dating one of them in high school, but since it was so long ago, there was nothing between them anymore. I was fine with him after meeting him, and she assured me there was no romantic history with any of the others. Later, I found out she and he would send suggestive content to each other, which led me to discover more. I also noticed she would text and call this friend far more often and frequently than she would text or call me. A guy she used to casually see contacted her, saying he missed her and thought she was really cool. I asked her to block him. She didn't understand why but said she did it, though I never verified this. She refused to admit that he was likely reaching out to rekindle things, insisting he was just being friendly. I told her it didn't matter, it was a firm boundary for me not to be in contact with previous flings or exes. If she did that, I didn't want to be in a relationship. She said I was being controlling and insecure but agreed to respect that boundary. I should have ended things there, but I didn't. She had an out-of-town friend she attended shows with, and she swore many times that she had never been intimate with him. I had multiple conversations with her, expressing my belief that this guy was interested in her and wanted to be more than friends. He would pressure her to take substances with him and had taken advantage of her friend. He was involved with a married woman. This guy was trouble, and I knew it. She wanted to go out with him one night, and I said I would trust her, asking only that she text me when she got home. She never did. She swore to me that she just got too drunk and forgot. She invited me to the show they had planned for the next day, and he was clearly upset that I was there. They had a big argument, and he went home. After I saw inappropriate content with her other friend, I looked in her messages with her permission and found out that she actually did have a romantic history with this person and had lied to me about it multiple times. I still don't believe that she didn't spend the night with him when she got too drunk and forgot to text me back. I broke up with her immediately upon discovering this, as I had set a firm boundary about honesty. I probably could have found much more information, but what was the point? I had all I needed to know to end the relationship. There were plenty more red flags. I found some suspicious items in her backpack. She was very secretive with her phone. She would get texts from unsaved numbers and claim I was just imagining it, insisting nothing was there and she never deletes anything. I was manipulated into believing her for 8 months, and it made me feel terrible. I talked to my therapist constantly about this, she suggested I trust her, as that is all I could do. I even considered medication, thinking I must be losing my mind. 
She promised me many times that she would never lie to me, never do anything to hurt me, and did not want to ruin our relationship. She said she loved me so much. She was supposed to move in in three weeks. We had future plans together. I feel relieved to be out of this relationship, it was mentally exhausting. I never had trust issues in any previous relationship until this one. At the same time, I wish I could talk to her again and work things out, but I know the trust is completely gone. It is a terrible feeling. I would not wish this on anyone. I suppose I dodged a bullet, but right now, I feel awful. A missed Uber home led got us lost and we somehow contracted food poisoning. The walk home was unspeakable. Using a throwaway account because I prefer not to have my real name associated with this online. My friend, a 27-year-old female, and I, a 26-year-old female, went to Lollapalooza for the first time this year, which was actually two weeks ago. We're not from the Chicago area, but I am from a nearby state and have been there many times before. We thought we had planned everything out so that the two days we only went Thursday and Friday would go smoothly. We made our lineup of every artist we wanted to see on the application, and our first artist on Thursday was Chapel Roan, who didn't go on until 5 o'clock. We were staying at a hotel about 40 minutes outside of Chicago and could check in at 3 o'clock, so that was our plan, check in as soon as we could and make the drive to Lollapalooza, planning to get there around 4 o'clock, accounting for traffic, or so we thought. Maps had us getting to our prepaid parking garage around 4.40. Whatever, we both thought. It takes 5 minutes to walk from the garage to the north entrance, and then about 15 minutes to walk from that end of the park to the stage where Chapel was performing. Worst comes to worst, we miss a couple of Chapel's songs. No sweat. Key the first mishap, not accounting for the chaos that is Chicago and Lollapalooza traffic. Now, I'm from a decent-sized city, the second biggest in my state, so I'm fairly comfortable with downtown traffic. Chicago, however, is a different challenge. Our navigation system took us through various routes, and we arrived downtown as expected, but the entire city felt like a construction zone. Cones, people in orange vests, and unclear signs left us thoroughly confused. The navigation system instructed us to turn right, but cones made us believe the road was closed. It wasn't until later that night, during our eventful walk back, that we realized the cones were actually guiding us into our parking garage, not blocking off the street. Second mistake, not following directions. Maps malfunctioned when we missed a turn and never brought us back to the crucial street corner, the only one leading to the underground parking garage. We ended up circling Grant Park for over an hour. At one point, I rolled down my window and heard Chapel singing Red Wine Supernova, and I promptly burst into tears. Finally, instead of trying to find our designated parking garage, we decided to cut our losses and park at the nearest garage we could find, which ended up being at Navy Pier. Despite knowing it would be expensive, I had been to Navy Pier many times, and we both needed to use the restroom. By then, it was about 5.40, and Chapel's set ended it at 6 o'clock. I accepted with disappointment that I wouldn't be seeing Chapel but hoped we could still catch Kesha's set between 6 and 7. Not familiar with the public transportation system, I called my brother who lives in the city and asked him which bus could get us from, Navy Pier to Grand Park. He told us, we waited about 20 minutes, and then got on the bus. Around 6.30, we finally arrived at Grant Park with our wristbands on. The wristbands needed to be activated through an application, which my friend and I both had. She activated hers in the car quickly, but mine would not work no matter how many times she tried. Thinking we could fix it once inside, we proceeded, only to realize that the wristbands had to be activated to enter the park. As I mentioned, we were first-time festival goers. So, you can consider this part a mistake or not. I would argue this was the first thing that wasn't our fault. The workers directed us to the wristband tent, where we promptly found out that my wristband number simply wasn't in their database. It wasn't that it had already been claimed or anything. It just didn't exist. My friend bought our bands through Lollabaloo's official website and had the receipt pulled up on her phone, so my wristband was replaced after a few minutes of the workers looking completely lost as to why my band didn't exist in the first place. Whatever. We got into the park. We met up with a few friends of my friend, a 27-year-old woman and a 29-year-old man, and immediately decided we needed food. If you have been to Lollapalooza, you know the food options are extensive. There are numerous choices available. We girls ended up getting Mexican food, while the guy chose pulled pork. I was the only one to get the chicken nachos that I kept seeing people walk by with. They were a little spicy but overall tasty. A 29-year-old man went to see Megan the Stallion while we girls sat under some trees to relax until Hosier's performance. We chatted until a little before 8 o'clock, then headed to the main stage. None of us were huge Hosier fans, but he was great. About half an hour into the set, I realized I wasn't feeling well. I had gotten my period that morning, so I attributed it to cramps. Knowing my friend wasn't that into Hosier anyway, I told her I wasn't feeling well, and we decided to leave. We accepted the day's loss but at least got back to our hotel to catch some sleep before the next day. 
I had texted my brother earlier, and he told us which bus stop would take us back to Navy Pier, the one on Michigan and Randolph, just about two blocks from the north entrance. Not a bad walk if you know where you're going. We did not know where we were going, even with MAPS guidance, so we ended up walking much longer than we should have. Just as we got to the bus stop, I looked at my friend and said, Hey man, I really don't feel good. Turns out mistake number three was getting the chicken nachos at Lollapalooza. To stay within the community guidelines, I'll keep it vague. Let's just say I had a rough night in Chicago. Five times. Luckily, everything came out the same way it went in, but it was unpleasant. A group of guys walked by and assumed I was drunk, saying, let it all out and we salute the fallen, so at least I gave some Chicago guys a good laugh. While waiting at the bus stop, a police officer approached us and informed us that a bus would not be coming because the street was closed for the festival. Great. At this point, we decided to spend the excessive amount of money it would cost to Uber to Navy Pier. When we tried to use the application, it indicated that it could not pick us up from our location, and that we needed to walk another three blocks to a pickup spot. Mistake number four, not understanding how to use the Uber application. After walking another block and leaving a part of myself in Chicago, we checked the application again and realized it could pick us up wherever we were. We were just clueless about dragging the pin. So, we sat on the Chicago sidewalk and waited for our black Lincoln with a license plate starting with a 7. Mistake number 5, chasing the wrong black Lincoln with a license plate starting with a 7. My friend was convinced this car was our Uber. I was less sure, but we ran after it down the street. The driver rolled down his window and gave us a puzzled look. My friend asked if he was our Uber, and he said no before quickly rolling his window back up. Great. Now my stomach hurts again because I exerted myself while dealing with food poisoning from chicken nachos. There went another part of me. The story has a happy ending. Our actual Uber driver was very nice and got us back to our parking garage. By that point, there was no chicken nacho left in my stomach, so I was able to drive the hour plus it took to get to our hotel without pulling over or using the empty plastic bag I found in my back seat. I took a shower at the hotel and fell right to sleep. The next morning, I took some Pepto-Bismol, ate a sleeve of crackers, drank a lot of liquid four, and mapped out the exact street corner to turn on to get to our actual parking garage. I only ate prepackaged snacks that our other friends had at their hotel, which was right across the street from the festival. In other words, we absolutely crushed Friday, and I got to see Renee Rapp bring out Chance the Rapper, which was nothing short of life-changing.